Universal Soldier, the movie yeah. adaptation, um, and a couple other things, um, and then uh, that kind of went away, and so I worked in radio for 44 years, and finally when the, the boys asked me to be on this goofy podcast called The Adventure Zone, we kind of did that, and much like your story, somebody calls and said, hey, that'd make a good graphic novel, why don't you do that? <laughs> We said, okay. And honest to God, that's our normal story of how, how that came about. God, tell me yours is more normal. No one has ever said to me of a graphic novel, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that just never happened for me. Um, I went to art school. Uh, art school became film school. Film school became animation. Animation became dropping out of art school and starting uh, 
to have agency of sorts, a motion design graphics uh, uh, agency with some uh, friends who also either graduated or dropped out, and then um, having a career making little, you know, either animated shorts for ourselves or commercials for, you know, clients. Uh, and I kind of never stopped doing comics for myself throughout the period of time just because it was nice to not have a client. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I came from an art school idiom where you interact with peers by talking about your work and sharing your work and stuff, and so it, I would meet people from comics and show them on you know, my demo reel or whatever we were working on. Uh, and, a bit, and then I started to write my own stuff and sort of uh, short stories and self-publishing, or not, uh, uh, you know, independent uh, press, uh, functionally self-published. Um, and then kind of one thing led to being asked, well, would you ever want to, you know, you want to work at Marvel, uh, uh, you want to try to submit? And for a couple of years, I just kind of went through submission processes, but had this day job, it was fairly satisfying. Mm -hmm. So if it ever got to a point where I didn't want to do it anymore, because it would be, I'd be like, ah, I'm going to go make a music video and have to buy it. I thank you for the opportunity, you guys should get somebody else for this. And they're not used to people saying no, uh, which makes them very squirrely for you. Uh, because well, why, why not? Because they don't need it. What? What we want? What, what? Everyone says yes. Why are you saying no? What are you? What? what? I had the blessing of only saying yes to stuff I wanted to do, so it made me appear to be a much stronger writer than I was. Did you just have the joy of making? Is that no, no, because it was legitimately not worth the. Mm -hmm. Suicidal ideation it provokes, you know, and like, oh, I can't imagine anything worse than writing a vampire jubilee comic. So, no, thank you. Like, there's more use to it. Like, yeah, but there are people though who are freelancers, and this is what they want to do, and they're going to throw themselves at every project. And it's that freelancer panic of being afraid that the phone's going to ring again, which I'm sure we all know about. Yeah. But I. I was already like, I really am okay. I can go hate making commercials with Budweiser just as easily as I can hate writing your Jubilee Vampire story. But the Budweiser thing is going to put us six figures, you pay nine dollars in a sandwich. So just, just an economic thing. You got a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> but they only show me at the Marvel Cat Fun Forum. Oh my god! Uh, so, long story long, when I realized I didn't want to make commercials for a living and sort of threw myself into writing full time. I had a small body of work built up, but it was all stuff I knew I could get. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all stuff I, I had to take on. Might, have been, not, might not have been great, but I was super into everything. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of threw myself with no other option into comic book work. And mm -hmm. the combination of luck and timing led to that being mm -hmm. That's, that's actually super helpful because I've got some other comic people kind of talking to me. I'm supposed to talk into the mic, so sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've got some other comic book folks sort of poking at me now and saying, hey, you seem to be doing a decent job. Do you want to do this other thing you've never heard of? Uh, and now I should say no. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Super horny. All right. right. Super horny. They'll come back with even more money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
and kind of tailored to other people's tastes and so forth. I'm not used to that. I'm the auteur. Um, so what best practices or, or what kind of good collaborations have you guys had? And maybe toss in a couple of horror stories or two. We, uh, we have had, uh, with the graphic novels, we have been extremely fortunate in that very early on, and, and actually part of the whole planning process was Carrie Peach was connected to our, yeah, go ahead, she's amazing. Um, and it came about in a very organic way. Carrie had been a huge fan of the podcast and was doing all kinds of fan art, and, and we just absolutely loved it. And from that point on, we asked her to do one of the posters for one of our live shows, and we met her and had a great conversation. And with Carrie, it's, it is almost a daily conversation with, the, with our graphic novels. Um, we had a lot of input in the actual visual design, um, but it was Carrie's visual concept uh, that, that we played into. And with the process that we have, it, it, the kind of convoluted part of it for us is there are four of us, me, Justin Griffin, and, and Travis, and so we're coordinating, you know, stuff's going back and forth. And with, with uh, some of the programs you've got, you can, you can share those documents instantly. And so then Carrie is involved and she's making the adaptations. We do a lot of notes with her. And it's, it's very much, it, it's one of the most collaborative things, you know, I've ever been involved in. Some of the stuff that I've done with, you know, we did a, uh, a couple of issues we did, of the Journey into Mystery, we did a miniseries tied in with the, uh, the, uh, the, the Thor event, the War of the Realms. And that's not quite as uh, back and forth communications mm -hmm. um, and a little bit more control. But with Carrie, it's, it's really been a, a very terrific process for us. So there's a good story. Horror stories, anyone? <laughs> I don't actually do a whole lot of collaboration. Um, yeah, you are the uh, tour on the panel. Yeah, you are the uh, tour on the panel. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and honestly, I have had people, like, I've had a lot of people pitch me, like, single panel gag ideas. Every once in a while, there's, like, some good ones, but, like, the last thing I want to do, honestly, is draw somebody else's mm -hmm. idea. I would rather have an idea and have somebody else draw it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so most of, most of what I do is just, mm -hmm. you know, this so you can the syndicated, the, the weekly thing we were doing, mm -hmm. there was not a lot of, like you didn't have an editor to kind of... These yeah. were all weeklies, I got paid in buttons. Oh, no. so, okay. Yeah, I really, that was actually, even huh. though it was like the least lucrative like, thing, it was the most fun because I could just really do whatever I wanted. Nice. Uh, do, you, do you still have the rights to them? Sorry? Do you still have the rights to them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you, you can reprint them now. Yeah. You should make them. For all six people that give a shit, yes. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, but, like, there's a. I had a book at Marvel once got canceled. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out who's going to draw the last couple of sheets. And it was hard to find anybody. And at some point I said to them, well, why don't we just stop? Like sometimes your favorite show doesn't get a finale, right? Like just stop. Let's stop throwing good money after bad. You want me working on other things. You want other artists working on other things. Like why are we going to keep mm -hmm. chasing a dog? This is what we we still have certain financial requirements of the book for this quarter. And I was like, oh, so the book isn't losing money. It's just not making you enough money. And they said yes. And I realized that if I owned a book selling what that book sold, I wouldn't have to work for Marvel. I don't have shareholders. I don't have overhead, right? I don't have thousands of employees and merch and all this stuff. I don't have quarterly projections that happen. So just that order of magnitude, what if all evening needs to make money, what any of us need to make money, it's so it's different from right. So that was a big I don't need to but hey, it'd be great to sell a million books. I don't need that to be happy and functioning what I'm doing. But that's just that order of magnitude for big corporations that are part of bigger corporations versus you know, actual creator to audience is, is a different thing. 
That's kind of a, a horror story just in itself. The idea that a comic could be successful, could be making money, and yet they still cancel it just because... Well, that's not that's the reality of overhead, right? If we don't need our quarter, we have to lay people off, right? That's what business is. That's capitalism in this, you know, that's the way it works. The capitalism is a running horror story in there. Um, all right, okay. Well, so with your the horror, horror, story. horror story there is late stage capitalism. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's, that was a really eye-opening, and that, you know, uh, an independent book can sell marvelously, and it wouldn't be worth, it's like a story, it's not worth Bill Gates' time to stop and pick a hundred dollar bill up off the street. <laughs> it's like, a oh, super worth my time? It's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When you were working on Far Sector, did you feel like you had enough of an input in the creative process for the visuals because it's very dis the, the visuals are so distinct and so terrific yeah. and yet very reflective of, mm -hmm. of, of your your writing and, and the whole concept mm -hmm. and you were basically creating a whole universe there I mean it's, mm -hmm. it's so did you were you satisfied with the collaborative nature of your with the artist um, I, I am still doing that aspect of it and yes um, the, the difference for me is I don't have a visual brain. I don't imagine images. So when I was writing the script... Yes. So soon is the same way. Huh. This is fascinating. Okay, it's not just me. Good. Yeah, yeah, right. you yeah. Know, yeah okay. that's fascinating. All right. Well, yeah, so as I'm writing these scripts and I'm like, I have to describe this for the artist. And I'm like, eh, eh. And there's, there's several pages in the script that are just like, this is what I, the mood that I want to convey, go right. nuts. Right. 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 Um, and, and Jamal Campbell, who was the artist for Far Sector, was, who was just fucking amazing. Um, Jamal was like, cool. Um, and he went nuts, and, it, and it, it's just like, it's like he's reading my mind. And I don't know if that's just his genius, or if that's a normal thing for comic book writers, because this is the first time I've ever done it. Has seeing it depicted visually taught you something about your work or told you something about your work that hadn't occurred to you? I think so, um, in the sense that uh, I am apparently good at describing things. Like, I, I don't always, you know, like, like, you're not supposed to look at critiques when you're, you're not supposed to look at reviews when you're a writer because that way lies day drinking. Um, but, uh, but I do. And uh, I, I often limit it to doses of reading reviews, and then I let it go. But um, but I will read my reviews, and a constant critique that I get is um, I can't I can't visualize what's happening. Like as compared to other fantasy writers, I am apparently very spare in my descriptions. But apparently, compared to other comics for comic book writers, I'm I'm getting plenty um, because he's getting it like he's nailing it. And I don't know, like in some cases, I'm literally not saying, like I've, I've given the, the idea of what's happening, but then he's just kind of coming up with it. So, um, but he's doing a good job, and I'm loving it. Is that a, is that, that a one? Yes, that, yes, yes, that is. I've just heard three years ago. Oh, all right. Yeah, no, that's, that's just him. Because the beauty, and, and, and Matt does the same thing, is what I love about Far Sector is, it's it's not a, a comic that you can flip through. But I mean, you have to read it, and you've still got those wonderful visuals, and it's it's really good storytelling. You like it? <laughs> Will you sign my copy? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, all right. So the next question that I have: um, fear of offending people. Is that a thing? Or are you working through it? Or are you like, fuck these people, I'm going to write what I want. Especially, I'm going to give people writing political cartoons. Um, and it is a fraught time in particular to be writing political cartoons. Um, but it's a fraught time to be in any aspect of comics and graphic novels right now, too. Um, where uh, you know, a panel that you decide to write your draw could set off a harassment campaign or something. Um, are these things that are that are inhibiting to you guys now? Are you feeling defiant with these things? Or are you just kind of like, we'll deal with that when it, when it happens? At this point, I feel like it's something that, it's a new layer of thought that I have in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't necessarily describe it as inhibitive 
It just, it's like something more to consider. And when I do something that doesn't land well, if somebody points out a way in which this is hurtful that I hadn't considered, mm -hmm. like, I, I hope I do my best to be like, oh, you know, you're, you're right. And I will fold this understanding into what I do uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like you need to be able to like be free and unfettered and unfiltered with what you're writing, but you don't necessarily need to be that with what you put out in the world. So I try to get stuff down without any, you know, overarching editor, mm -hmm. and then I try to prune a little bit more carefully when I put it in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Other folks, anyone? Um, I think. An extra layer of it is, also, is a great analogy. And uh, comedy, at the very base of comedy, there's there has to be, and in the very base of, of just general writing, there has to be conflict. Mm -hmm. There has to be some kind of, of it, I always think of two, two times on a pair of scissors that, times? Mm -hmm. Sure. Two sizz on a pair of scissors. <laughs> Have to come together and to to make something to make something change. And I've always felt like there has to be that conflict. There has to be, especially especially in comedy. I mean, you have to be able to make fun of something. Um, and and I, have, you know, for like I said, forty four years I did morning radio with. You know, you're always. I always think there's going to be somebody who's going to take offense at something. I think uh, your intent. Uh, is is a is a big key as to what's going. I mean, now I can't even tell you some of the stories that I offended people with because they'll throw me off the boat. Um, that's the the old saw that if something's offensive, it isn't funny. You know, if something's funny, it isn't offensive. Yeah, you know that there's a there is absolutely a line. It's a line that moves, and it's a line that you know. I'm almost worried about uh, uh, through my ignorance. Doing it through my own lack of consideration, mm -hmm. like like not never knowing that it was a oh like never having uh, uh, m missing something any any uh, mission to grow empathy and understand perspective having a blind spot that is my my worry is, is the accidental offending or hurting of someone or omission of someone or that that's the thing that, that, that gives me the most agita. Mm -hmm. I just realized I had two waters. Did I steal your water, Emily? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, then they're both mine. <laughs> I'm offended that you're hurting this water. Yeah. I knew it! Uh, See? Yeah. Okay. I told you! I, told you. Um, I, I am wrestling with this as uh, far sectors, themes develop, and I had intentionally included some components on police brutality, uh, the use of the police state, and so forth. Um, which I did not realize were going to be as timely as they are as uh, we started moving into it. I wrote the script for Far Sector like two years ago. Um, and then there was a lot of fruit frying and hemming and hawing and back and forth with my agent as, as you see, was like an agent. Um, so, but, we, but it finally started to happen. Um, and in that time, presidential administrations had changed. Um, it's it's a little, been a little interesting. Um, and I, I guess from the stuff that's been happening in the fiction world, I'm now just kind of like, fuck it. Um, people in, in a lot of cases are offended by my existence and my presence in their space. So I might as well use it to say what I, what I want. Um, well, I, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I feel like there is a difference between being afraid to offend, you know, the man pretty much and being afraid to offend people that you know, you didn't intend oh, yeah, a yeah. joke to, to yeah, land that's a different level of being um, mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in some cases the man is the person publishing the comic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a little bit of an issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, so, um, we have reached the point where we've got enough time left, a uh, good bit of time, for audience questions. Unless there were other things that you guys wanted to fill in. Right. I did my water bit. Right. That was all I had. Okay. And so we've got some folks floating around with microphones. Raise your hands high, please. Uh, as you are asking your questions, do not give a speech in the form of a question. 
Um, please limit your questions to one part. Um, please actually ask questions and not quantifications um, and so forth. You should record a PSA that plays before every panel. I, I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, because we've, we've had some, we've had some uh, questionable questions. Um, but, you know, okay, we've got one here. Uh, this question is uh, primarily for Matt, but because I know his work better than, than the rest of you. Uh, my understanding is that you are primarily a writer and you bring other people in to do the illustrations. Yeah. Do you wish that you did more straight writing? Or are you kind of happy with that collaboration? No, I like taking credit for other people's work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have a model in me. I don't think that's where my strength lies. Um, and I like collaborating. Like I said, I came from art school. I like I like collaborating. Um, I like there's a joy and surprise I get when the work comes back in and I see how someone interpreted what I put on the page and what they put on the page, and then I get to rework accordingly. And the best stuff, the most successful stuff I've done have been back and forth up until the moment they take it out of our hands because it has to go to a printer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a consistent back and forth between writer and artist and letterer and colorist and everything. Like it's, it's a, you know, my process these days is, is, is erasing. I, I try to remove as much text as I can um, rather than adding more, I really like my, my I, like, I try to, the fewer words on the page for me, the better. I'm trying to be entirely invisible as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, to put the emphasis back on the visuals in the comics, since it is a visual medium. Mm -hmm. I think there's a play of comics right now with blocks of 400 word balloons that read like magazine articles with drawings of little kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think as a as a medium, <laughs> we've sort of forgotten an important couple things. Is there a difference? Uh, may I may yeah. I do yeah. may I follow up? Um, do you have a is there a difference in that satis that satisfaction level uh, between things that are wholly yours, like November that that we're mm -hmm. doing, and say the Jimmy Olsen books where there's an established visual look for characters? No, no, it's. Uh, um, no, not for me. I might be for other folks, uh, but I, I really, it's the same enjoyment. It's the same. You know, if there's something, I've got words in Superman's mouth, and I've noticed when I write him, I sit up. <laughs> my posture changes because I don't want him to see me. Oh, yeah, my full job. Of and he would. Yeah, yeah. Do, so do, like, you hmm? do you develop a cowlick? Do you develop a cowlick? Yeah. Just a, <laughs> he's, he's got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's there. Uh, like that's a magic kind of weird. Oh, what? oh my God! I can't. Yes, sir. Like I, it's just like my posture changes. I'm like no, that's great. Like that's just as fun as let's see what we can do with you know, this stuff. So it's... <laughs> okay, I think we had another question in the front here. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Nora because I'm fascinated by something you said earlier about mm -hmm. you don't see images when you're writing. Mm -hmm. How? <laughs> I, I, I can't explain it to other people who've had the same question for me. I feel like this is the whole, like, wait, you don't have an internal running monologue that you actually hear? Versus mm -hmm. people are like, what are you talking about? Do you hear voices? Like, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Some, no, I, some I, people I, do not have visual imaginations. And yeah. that is literally the what? There's no movie. In yeah, she is not. Kelly Sewell Wright starts up things with, like, huh. writing like a stage play. Huh. And then breaks it into acting beats. And then develops the script around that. Okay. Like, it is a similar, it's just a way of how you navigate the narrative. Mm -hmm. Do you hear it as words, or do you just sort of like feel it as, I, I feel like a, a sort of an internal mm -hmm. uh, tuning fork? Mm -hmm. Like, so is it something that is like, like legal or? The, the closest description I guess I can have is like when I, I, I don't write poetry, but when I read poetry, images sort of. Like, my father is a, is a visual artist, um, and, and I'm from a line of artists, and sadly, like, I tried my best to be a visual artist, and it was always just blotches on paper. Um, but he also did blotches on paper, and then somehow it came together into an image. So this whole impressionistic thing um, is, I guess, what's happening, is I, I, there's a mood that I'm trying to convey, there's an overall, like, I need them to be in a particular kind of place, 
I put words together until they feel like that place. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Well, okay, good. All right. Does it translate also when you read? Or when you uh, read yeah. someone else's, do you process it the same way? In some ways. Um, what I have noticed is that I don't like people who over-describe. Because then you're interfering with whatever's happening, happening in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess they're writing for those people that need that visual tug-along. But for me, they're just getting in the way of what I'm, whatever is already happening in my head. So, so uh, you... Uh, let's see. <laughs> It's okay. Explaining, you're explaining, oh, I'm explaining all at the same time. I'm thrilled. Uh, uh, are you familiar with uh, the origin of what's called plot style scripting in comics, like Marvel style scripting? No. So when Marvel became Marvel, uh, they were allowed to exist only to prove that National did not have a monopoly over comics and distribution. They were the smallest publisher in the country. Huh. They're like, well, let you stick around. You can use our, distribu- our distribution routes. Look how magnanimous we are. We couldn't be monopolies. <laughs> this little guy's around. Uh-huh. But part of the rules on this handshake deal was who can publish more than what you're publishing right now, which was eight books. Mm-hmm. So uh, Mark Goodman, the owner, came back, uh, told his nephew Stan, good news, bad news. Good news, you are editor-in-chief of the new Marvel Comics. Bad news is you're also our only writer. Here's your budget, hire the cheapest guys you can, put eight books out. So suddenly this guy had eight comics to write a month. And he developed what became known as Marvel style or plot style scripting, where instead of page one, panel one, a dark and stormy night, we open in New York City, he would write pages one through three, uh, the Fantastic Four come home from their latest adventure. It's a sunny morning and everybody's laughing and having a good time. Suddenly Dr. Doom crashes in. Pages four through eight, uh, or it's a very uh, different degrees. And if you look at early Marvel art, uh, you can see where Jack Kirby stuff, especially, he will write over each panel. He's breaking that down. Thing walks in, Johnny makes a joke, he drops the pancakes, explosion. Right? <laughs> so, but it was a Stan was like, Bruce is incredible. Right? Mm-hmm. I listened to the editor in chief of Marvel, and one of the big writers had an argument. The editor in chief was also, at the time, was an artist. Um, he's an artist, he was the editor in chief at the time, he is no longer. Right, okay. Um, saying that, oh, well, the books that made Marvel had these big dynamic visual moments, and now we're in such a writer's era that we've gotten away from the visual firepower of what made Marvel Marvel. Huh. And this writer's like, no, let's give it, that's not writing, that's blah, 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 blah. And I realized I was getting, like, heart palpitations. Oh, no. Like, no, no, no. It was, it was it made me nervous. And I was like, oh, I have to do that. Uh, I, was, I need to do that. I need to yeah. do the thing that makes me frightened. Uh-huh. And I think all of my books are better for it. I don't do it on every book. But that level of trust, mm-hmm. right, that level of, hey, look, mm-hmm. if there's four paragraphs on a page, you can tell I'm thinking it's maybe four panels, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. not necessarily. But it becomes a collaborative, mm-hmm. and through that process, mm-hmm. I found what I need to do is start a script with, like, a man and a verb. Mm-hmm. He sits. <laughs> this is a physical action for you to draw. Uh, he sits. This yeah. is a physical beat if you want to see it. Mm-hmm. Sit. But you know what? He's really still thinking about his dad, and he wishes he was here. He's also hungry. That dog's got to be in the room. I can draw. And here's all the undrawn stuff. Mm-hmm. And then an artist can mm-hmm. you know, uh, work what they do, and it becomes a much more visually collaborative experience, mm-hmm. I find. Okay. So, so that kind of, I think there's something similar to mm-hmm. not writing from a not visual place, writing in undrawables, mm-hmm. like that's where, yeah, that's especially in superhero comics, where it's so much about yeah, people should be raised out of the face, you know? I have not found my comic scripting voice. Um, this is the first time I've ever done comic scripts, and so I was literally teaching myself how to write in script format. So the way that I did it was, uh, among other things, I got the 2080 script book, Mm-hmm. Um, that someone had recommended to me. <laughs> why, 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 why? Okay, I, I'm just going to let this up there. Uh, well, so the 2080 script book, for those of you who haven't seen it, one side of the page is, is scripts written by various script writers, and the other page is how the artist then chose to render that page. So for me, it was useful to see this is how you explain things to an artist, and this is what the artist is going to hear after that explanation. And there were many different styles at work, so I kind of just cobbled together. Like, but but I would put in sort of you know this is the thing that happens, but then all of them were, were including things like camera angles and types of shots. 
None of that meant anything to me, so I essentially put that in at random. That's not your job. Well, well, yeah. well, yeah. That's not their job. Now we know. But that came from an era of writer controlled comics. Well, now I have to come up with camera plot because on the record I'm writing everything. I'm controlling this stage. I'm the director. Now it's you're the writer. Because I just stuck in random camera angles. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I literally was like, I guess I have to do camera angle here. Well, the last one I used was like top down, let's do forward, whatever. I mean, you saw the die of camera angles. And when Jamal came on board, I was like, well, the camera angles are just bullshit, so like, do what you want. It, it, it's great. <laughs> so, how would you feel that if you know, someone of Jamal's caliber mm -hmm. was like, oh, well, you said it should be a medium shot. Now, in his head, he saw yeah. Jamal, Jamal scope. Right. Right? I guess yeah. it's a hobbling, because it's not our training, right? He's completely ignoring all of the camera shit, and I'm glad. I yeah. asked him to, great. because it was horseshit. When, so, when, when, I, when I teach comic workshops, one of my favorite things to do is I show mm -hmm. two different panels from two different books. It is functionally the same shot. Mm -hmm. It's an establishing shot on a shoreline, and two guys are walking up the beach. Mm -hmm. One script for that panel is literally three pages of text. The other one says, it's a shoreline, it's about dawn, two guys are walking up the beach. Yeah, I think that's What cool. gives you, but it's the same. So like to do that, to take a script, like take a book that's finished, write this page in your voice. How would you take this page of comics that you love mm -hmm. and, and, and make a script out of it? That's a, was a really super helpful right. exercise. That 2018 was great. Yeah. You can sit, you can look and see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this guy just says, it's a shot of a guy. There's a story about a 2018 writer named Alan Grant who once the era of the writer came in the late 80s, uh, he was a, a derisively viewed by those who came after him um, um, because he was real good mm -hmm. and wasn't a novelist trapped in comics, but wanted to write comics, right? Mm -hmm. This is an era of guys writing three-page descriptions for one panel, oh, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. and Alan Grant once wrote a, a panel description which was Batman, comma, Grim, period. <laughs> That is the perfect Batman script. That is the perfect Batman panel. You can write three pages. You will never get better than Batman, comma, Grandma. That works. That works. Okay. We should get some questions. I was vamping. Uh, all right. So I see a person back there. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, on the other end of that spectrum, how do you guys write dialogue that feels like it's coming from a person or mm -hmm. coming from a particular character without doing the whole here's a giant level of text every time. Okay. I actually do a fair amount of giant level of text. Oh, wow. um, I in my longer form stuff, um, I I basically just sort of tell myself the I do sort of like a visual essay thing and I do a lot of like kind of telling myself the essay as I'm trying to get it down. I try to window it down so that it will fit in like the number of boxes that I have. But I, I straight up like some of it, I'm like, oh, I have two panels that are literally just text. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the one to ask. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I know, but, but that's, but that's, if it, that would maybe not be a great Green Lantern comic. Right. But it is a great Emily Blake comic. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Like it's just different, mm -hmm. right? Idioms are like, why is the horse in the outer space movie? Right. No, it's better for a Western, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think also the, uh, I mean, obviously you have to go with the characters, but I sometimes think the relationship between the characters that are being portrayed in the panel. Uh, one of the things that drives me crazy, and it's, I'm not naming no names, but sometimes in some of the big epic crossover books that happen, you've got, you know, 15 characters all doing battle or whatever it is, and everybody is a smart ass. Everybody is throwing out quips. Well, that's one of the things that made Spider-Man so original in, you know, back in the Civil War when I first started reading Spider-Man. Was that the Civil War? Or it was, was, uh, it was <laughs> maybe it was Secret Wars, uh, but Spider-Man was so unique because he was the one throwing out these wisecracks and, you know, everything else was, was very grim and it drives me nuts. And these are, and some of these have been some of my favorite writers of all times, where everybody is that same wise-cracking, funny, mm -hmm. do a joke, or the other end of it seems to be everybody is throwing out that, you know, one big 
epic statements, we got to do it, something along those lines. And I think that it's dictated by the, the sometimes the relationship between the characters. Don't have too many people being the, the wisecracker. Um, and I think it, it you, you take on a little bit of that acting aspect as a writer. I, the thing about sitting up straighter. When you do the Superman, do you take your glasses off? <laughs> That's why I just have typos when Superman talks in my class. <laughs> but I mean, you have to channel a little bit of your inner actor, your inner inner performer. What would they say? Oh God, I do faces. I catch myself doing faces. Oh, oh shit, shit, shit. No, oh, someone's on me. I do faces. It's so embarrassing. You know, you know, I wonder if the quick thing is a generational thing because it feels to me like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the, the Joss Whedon style of of characters just joking with each other is conversation. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of that, and it is how I and my friends communicate too, um, but we're all like products of that particular generation. So I wonder, I wonder if that is a generational thing. Hmm. I think it depends on what the comic is, mm -hmm. right? I think it depends on who's drawing it, depends on the scene. My, I, guess, so my alarm goes off that if there's more than three lines of text in a bubble, mm -hmm. there's a little rule of thumb you can use for how many words should be on a page, assuming kind of that math. You can thumb down, hey, if there's 27 words in a balloon, that's usually about right. That's about as big as I like to go. You can find dozens of examples in my work where I've gone over. Mm -hmm. Like, I did one where the balloons were so big we made it a gag in sex criminals where there's just big blocks of text and like knocking people out of a window. <laughs> <laughs> then it becomes part of yeah. It was just the way around it. So this guy has to say nine pages of shit. So we just like blasted a wall out, it knocked the window over. Um, but like you know, there's there's that's part of the collaboration. Um, like a, a a good collaborator will send you thumbnails of what they're thinking for the page, but also will have their balloons roughed in and will point out. Hey, you got nine pounds of shit and a four pound bag up here, so can you tighten that up? Mm -hmm. and then, oh, right, I gave him a monologue on a panel that is just a head and a bubble, so let me just have him say, great, instead of, you know, so like, oh, there's, there's a ton of background of not being precious in the script. We had a, I made an intern one time count words in one of my scripts versus words that appeared in the final book, mm -hmm. and it was about, um, three-fifths of what I wrote, no one but the artist ever saw. Hmm. So two-fifths ends up on the page. Like, oh, yeah, the rest is just writing for the collaboration, you know, so like, that's kind of not being precious with that last two-fifths and all of it being in service of art. And, like, I hate it when balloons cover up amazing art. Hmm. And you know there's something back there, there's something weird, like, so it's a lot of push and pull and not being precious and realizing, hey, the image is better than my quit. Right. Or I can put I, I, yeah. it later, let me tighten this up in service of this great panel. I want an intern. <laughs> How do you guys not have interns? I don't have interns. I don't know, man. Right. My daughter's my intern, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I don't have an intern either. <laughs> okay, we all got an intern in the now. So. Um, and, and, you know, to from what you were saying, Matt, uh, I, I have been reducing my, my scripts have gotten less wordy as I've gone along and as I've understood Jamal's style. Yeah. And I've realized his visuals are telling a chunk of the story that I don't need to tell. So I can, I, and in fact, I've revised my scripts um, just before he started doing his, um, you know, his uh, sort of the pencils. Um, I've reduced a lot of the text and removed bubbles entirely because it's not necessary. Yeah. He's got that. Yeah. So it's nice to have somebody who can be in line. And I've found that in the Adventure Zone as well. In the Adventure Zone we, where basically we're adapting the podcast, that's the, the starting point. That's the framework we're using. And we're well, you, guys, are, are you guys have podcasts? Yeah, when we're starting, we dabble. We dabble. Oh, and so you want a podcast? I trade you one podcast for an intern. Now I'll alter the title. Stuff that you wish we had. <laughs> but I found there were a couple of times where, I, where one of the characters would go, man, look at this gigantic statue with his arms out raised. Because you have to do that podcast. you got to describe it. And then Carrie would write back, you know I'm going to draw that. Right? Say, oh, look, the sky. Yeah, we figured. 
But really, I think that restrictions of any kind are really helpful for art. You know, mm -hmm. so if it's if it's a space constraint mm -hmm. um, and that forces you to really cut as much and more you can, yeah, you know, I think it's it's a it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. We've got, um, I'm trying to make sure that we clear enough time for the next panel to clear out and clear in, which is why we started a little late. Um, so we've got about two minutes left for questions. I see we've got our microphone person here. Well, I, I was going to try and make, piggyback off the first, the last question and, and the, the, the stuff you guys went on with and <laughs> kind of covered a lot of what I was going to ask about. But so the, the, the tight little part that I'm concerned about is character and voice. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a famous TV writer whose name rhymes with Larkin, and every character in every show he's ever done, the people speak exactly the same way, they sound exactly the same, they're mm -hmm. undifferentiable. Mm -hmm. How in the tight space that you guys are working with mm -hmm. do you create character and voice? I don't do character voices. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, running joke. I do. Um, I'm glad you asked that because for the most part, the longer form stuff I do is very autobiographical, so I don't have to worry about it. It's my, oh, it's literally my voice. But I um, am starting to work on a young adult graphic novel um, that I'm writing, and I'm really going to have to figure out exactly how to give people their own voices while still saying what I want to say. Mm. So get back to me in a year. <laughs> it's hard. It takes work. I mean, that's, I think that's, mm -hmm. like, it's just, you grind it out, and you look at it, and you see where it works and where it doesn't, and, it's you know, it's kind of how to write the question, how to right. write it. Yeah, it's real hard. Yeah. It's, it's and hard. you also need to, you know, like, read it aloud, you have other people read it aloud to you, you know, like, if you're just sitting there looking at the words on the page, like, you know, you're not going to hear, literally, the things that you would if you just get another pair of eyes on it and have somebody, like, give it back to you so that you can experience it as a, as a a reader. Hmm. Yeah, I, oh, I, I, I did. I did give Batman a different font. A different font. <laughs> it was smaller and bold and all in caps. <laughs> so that ran out. Yeah, different font size too. That's a quick shortcut. Font, 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 font choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I always have the crutch of the fact that you know I have Thanksgiving dinner with my three main characters every year because I'm very familiar with my own children. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've got the template of what those characters sound like and also how they deliver lines and how they say things. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I already, I'm basically lazy and I just adapt what we did in the podcast. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not visual, but I do hear characters in my head. So that, that's a little lazy. They talk, I, they don't shut up. <laughs> so. All right, um, we are uh, at time, so I'm a little over, but that's okay. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to my fellow panelists um, for sharing your wisdom. Um, and we'll clear the stage for the next thing. Thank you for That's what I've been Yeah, I think so. Dad, you know, stop. Right. <laughs> 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 questions.